Welcome back to Girls Next Level, everybody. Bridget, how was your week? I can't even think straight. I know, like, which week is it? <laughs> it's hard when you're starting off a new year because there's just, like, so much going on and getting back into the swing of things and stuff. Yeah, I'm just so confused. Like, if anybody's watching this on Patreon, the video, like, this table is a mess. Like, I don't know what's going on, but I do know we have some amazing questions from you guys that we are really excited to answer. Yeah, Q&A today. Bridget, I want to start off with the first question. What was the weirdest object you ever found at the Playboy Mansion? Because mine was a crack pipe, so I want to know what yours was. A crack pipe? A real one, yeah. But you go first. Okay. <laughs> well, Lane was in suspense. I know. Um, okay. Uh, I think the weirdest thing I ever found... I was doing... I was, like, investigating the basement because, like, I'd never really explored it that much. Yeah. And there was this section of the basement <gasps> that kind of went off in like a direction and honestly I don't even remember like how I got to it exactly but it was sort of unfinished which is weird because the whole basement is really finished in the mansion like it's um there's lockers down there for the employees and and storage and laundry and all that yeah. kind of stuff and so to find like a spot that was sort of unfinished and there was like weird boxes like in the corners and stuff like dusty and dirty and there was this um it almost looked like an altar of some sort, but not an Wait, altar. What? Not like a not like an altar, but like an <laughs> altar. But okay, so there was like an old, um, like record album uh -huh. cover. I don't know if the record was in there or not. Like on the floor, and there was like rose petals and like a burnt rose on it, what? and like burnt ashes on it. And we were like, "What kind of weird sacrifice it was this?" And we were like joking about it. We went and got Brian Alea to go check it out, and he was like laughing about it and said he had no idea what that was. Do you remember what the record album was? No. Who were they doing voodoo on? <laughs> I don't know, but it was really weird. I was like, what is this weird stuff back here? That is creepy. That is going to spark so many rumors, especially when we talk about, like, on our moment, we're going to talk about blind items, and there's the longest, world's longest blind item that has to do with, like, the Playboy basement, so. Yeah, I'm going to ask Brian Alea how that, how that's, how, what we found went again, because I know he went to investigate it, and I don't know, like, the end story, like, what happened. I think they just cleaned it up and said that, oh, it just looked like it was something, but it wasn't. Weird. Yeah. Oh my god! So crack pipe? Wait, what the <laughs> heck? Okay, so to set this story up, just so you guys know, if you were in the mansion in the Great Hall and you went into the living room, which means you had to walk like in between the two curving staircases. If you were walking toward the living room, on your right hand side there would have been a door, and if you went into that door, there would have been this tiny room that just had space for like a desk, a chair. And there was a landline phone on the desk, and that was called the phone room. I completely forgot about the phone room. Right? I so totally random. Totally forgot about the phone room. Forgotten nooks of the Playboy Mansion. Yeah. So I went to the phone room one day during the day. I forget why. Probably just had to make a random call or just needed a moment to myself. I don't know. And there's a crack pipe on the desk. And now I could not have told you what a crack pipe looked like before I found one. I've never seen anybody smoking crack. Even on like movies and TV, I've never really like paid close enough attention to see like what exactly a crack pipe looks like. Like how does it differentiate from another pipe? Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't know either. But trust me, when you find a crack pipe, you know what it is. So I picked it up in like my two fingers and I took it up to Mary's office. And I'm like, Mary, I found a crack pipe in the phone room. And what was also weird about this was this was on a random weekday when there was nobody at the house. It's not like it was during a party because that wouldn't have been, not that people were smoking crack at the parties. Like this is a really downscale drug more from what you would expect from being there. But it was like on a random day when there was nobody there. And I'm like, Mary, there's a crack pipe in the phone room. And oddly enough, she knew exactly who it belonged to. <gasps> she was like, oh, here, I can return that to the owner. I know. Like, I don't want to say who it was. It was one of half's friends who was like going through some issues at the time. But she knew exactly who it was. And that person got banned for a while. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's crazy. Crack piping it up. Woo. The next question is, when the mean girls heard about the show, Girls Next Door, did they try to become girlfriends to get on it? Like, did they try to come back? And also another question that kind of goes with that is, when you guys were filming the show, did other girls try to, like, move in and take your places? And for the second half of the show, I kind of feel like nobody really thought that was an option. 
Yeah, I felt like there were people that uh, wanted to do that. Ooh, I can cut it out if you don't want me to say the names. I mean, I actually don't have a specific oh, okay. person in mind, but there was people I got the vibe from that they uh-huh. were, like, wanting to do that. But, um, but I felt like we were so solidified in that, mm-hmm. that even though they made us feel like we were replaceable all the time or told us that we were yeah. replaceable all the time, it felt like a pretty cohesive group. Like, we all, I feel like we felt... I don't want to say secure because I feel like that gives the wrong impression, but I felt like everybody was very happy with the situation and the way it yeah. was, and nobody was looking for to replace somebody. Yeah, I kind of have a vague memory, and maybe this was just something I was paranoid about and wasn't really real, but I feel like when the show first started, there were some kind of whisperings of like maybe Kevin thinking, oh, what if you added another girl to the group? And that got shot down real quick by half. Yeah, so I feel like there was always a little bit of that. Like, uh-huh. And I think maybe it was just us two feeling that way because they always made us feel replaceable, mm-hmm. that maybe this new girl that's coming around is trying to take my place or they would like her better on the show or something. So I feel like there was always that possibility there. But at the same time, and I don't know how to describe this because it's it was happening simulta- simultaneously, but at the same time, there felt like a a sense of security to me about we were a very cohesive group. Yeah, definitely as the series moved along. And I think, too, when we look back, it's just obvious to us that kind of it seemed like everybody just thought that, oh, this is the group and this is the cast of the show. I don't think there were a bunch of women out there thinking there was a current opening and, oh, I'm going to go jockey to be the next girlfriend so I can be the star of the show. Yeah, but what was amazing about the show is there were so many other girls on it, too, that uh-huh. were our friends, our yeah. playmates, and people testing and coming and going. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that is very fun and exciting. And I think pe- some people did see that part as an opportunity That's to like, true. come and be a part of the show. Not necessarily to replace one of us, mm-hmm. but to be on it. Yeah, I think you're right. And when somebody asks about the mean girls trying to come back, they weren't trying to, as far as I know, while the show was going... But right after I broke up with Hef in 2008, the next thing I knew, the ringleader of the Mean Girls was, like, invited back. Like, she went from being kicked out, persona non grata, not allowed at the parties, to all of a sudden she's back at buffet dinners. And at the time, you know, I broke it off with Hef, and I just did not care. Like, I wanted nothing to do with it anymore. I didn't care. Like, she could have moved in and become the next main girlfriend, and I would have been like, I don't give a shit. That doesn't derail what I'm doing But it was odd to me how all of a sudden she was welcomed back like the next day. And I kind of feel like that was a tactic. Like maybe Hef was trying to make me jealous or make me rethink or feel threatened because, oh, this girl's coming back again. And so many years have passed that I didn't give a shit about that girl anymore. But I think he had it in my head as like that last girl was the last girl I was really competitive with, you know? Oh, well, and then I think we've mentioned this before, but before they got kicked out, they wanted nothing more than their own reality show. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that they would have done whatever they could to be on it. Oh, 100%. The next question is, was the mansion staff upset when the focus of the show shifted from them to you guys? And I don't think they were. You know, I heard there was a lot of relief. Oh, they yeah. They were like, because they didn't have a choice for this either. Nobody asked them, hey, do you guys want to do this show? Mm-hmm. They were just told, we're doing a show and it's about you guys. Like, you know what I mean? Like they And there was no pay grade as far as I know. It was just like, this is another responsibility. Yeah. And so I think that there was a lot of relief. I mean, was there some disappointment? I mean, probably. It's probably exciting when, when everyone's filming the pilot and stuff and you think that maybe this might go somewhere and do something. So I've, I've got to imagine that there was some mild disappointment, but what I heard mostly was just straight relief. I believe that for sure. Like if there was anybody who had been excited about the opportunity, it was a secret to us. Yeah. The next question somebody asks was, was plastic surgery really unlimited at the mansion? Meaning would Hef buy his girlfriends whatever plastic surgery they wanted? It definitely was not. I think some women who lived there in the past have said that like, oh, you get unlimited plastic surgery if you move in because they're just kind of like making a generalization of what a woman might think she's getting out of the situation. But it definitely wasn't unlimited, and it was a scary thing to ask for. I remember when I asked Hef if I could get my nose done, at first he didn't want to say yes, and it was a big back and forth, and he was telling me all these weird things, like, I don't think I love you anymore if your face was different, which was weird. <laughs> but, yeah. But it was it was something that wasn't fun to ask for. So it definitely wasn't unlimited. I never had any uh, plastic surgery while I was at the mansion, but one thing I do want to add to this is that anytime you did ask for something from 
from the mansion from Heth, whether it was plastic surgery or something else, they kept a folder in Mary's office on every ask and the receipts of it. Stop it. I didn't even know that. Yes. There was folders behind Mary that had each of our names on it. And she would pull out the folder. Like if I would say, oh, I really want to take these classes at UCLA or whatever. Uh-huh. She'd pull out the folder and be like, okay, well, you haven't asked for anything in a while. Oh. Like, you know, the last thing you got was, you know, have helped you pay for the car. So they had folders on each of us that kept track of exactly what we were asking for, how often, and how much it cost him. Interesting. I mean, it kind of makes sense to keep track of stuff like that, but it's also weird and seems like a weird tool to, like, hold over people's heads. Like, it's probably what contributed to that main mean girl getting kicked out was that time she asked for a new car, and they're like, okay, you've asked for too much. You've hit your limit. Yeah, they pulled her folder. I know. Exactly. That is crazy. I'm surprised you didn't know because I'd always, I wouldn't look at them, like not go through them. I mean, I wouldn't have been allowed to, but I could, I would always see them behind, sitting behind Mary. They were just like right there behind her in a stack and they kind of went like this right behind her. Yeah. I saw a ton of paperwork when I was in the office and stuff, but I would have never like looked behind Mary's desk and she never pulled it out in front of me. So that's probably why, but interesting. Next question. Did it ever bug you guys that Kendra didn't want to do any of the decorations or anything? That didn't bug me at all. Like, we always had to include her on everything we did and offer, and we wouldn't have wanted to not offer. But it didn't bother me. Like, I don't want to force anybody to do an activity they don't want. (laughs) Yeah, even to this day, I'm much better off doing something on my own than doing something with somebody who isn't into it. Exactly. Like, I'm the type of person who in school, like, I would rather just do a whole assignment myself than do a group project where I have to pull all the work. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, totally. Um, No, that didn't bother me. What bothered me was the non-participation later. Like, we put all this work into something fun and then not wanting to participate. Yeah. Did you guys, meaning me and you, ever have a fight while living at the mansion? I don't remember us ever fighting or disagreeing. Do you? Mm -mm. No. I feel like if we just ever had different interests or wanted to do different things, we would have just done it with other friends, I guess. Like, there was no reason to really ever be conflicted about anything. Yeah. And if there was anything that ever bothered me, then I would just ask you about it. Yeah. And then we would talk about it, and then that would be that. Drama-free situation. Okay, now with this next question, Bridget, I know you had at least one of these moments, and it'll be coming up in the next Girls Next Door episode we watch, so I don't know if you want to address that or not, but they're asking, did you ever ask the camera crew to leave because you felt uncomfortable? Wait, did I have a moment? That's Right, I fucking forgot about that. Uh, that one's going to be a two-parter, honey. <laughs> There's a lot that happens in that episode. Forgot. <gasps> uh, I feel like I should wait for that for next the next episode. Yeah, because you got done dirty. Yeah. Uh, that makes me so yeah. mad all over again. I can't wait till the next episode so I can talk shit about this. I don't remember ever asking the camera crew to leave because I felt uncomfortable. I do remember, like, telling playmates, oh, if you're going to change, go to the bathroom because the camera crew is going to try and, like, stick a camera next to your butthole, basically. But I don't ever feel like I had the power to say no so many times when I was there, you know? I do think it was easy for me, like, if they were trying... Well, they knew not to go into Hef's room. I was going to say it would have been easy for me to say, oh, Hef doesn't want you in here right now if you didn't, but I don't think they ever really tried to get into Hef's room. Yeah. Hmm. I feel like this is one that I can't answer right now until I watch more of the episodes, and then as I watch them, like the next one that's coming up, I will... um, I'll think of things that come up. Yeah, So I'll be sure sure to, like, let you guys know as they come up. How big was the mansion property? This question cracks me up because they go, it seems like a small parcel with a lot of stuff crammed (laughs) onto it. Well, whoever asked this, I don't know where you live. I don't know if you're in, like, Texas wide open spaces. But for Los Angeles, the mansion property is huge. Yeah, it was almost six acres. Yeah, like, there's a reason that's one of the most expensive properties in the city. Like, it's humongous and yeah there were a lot of things on it but it also had this 
huge backyard. It had grounds that you could get lost on in the park. It was huge. It has the biggest redwood forest in all of Southern California. Yeah. Because there are none. I so know. the redwood trees that are there can constitute as the biggest forest, redwood forest in, in LA. So it definitely was not a small parcel. I think maybe if you're from like out in the country, because I'm always surprised, like when I go to Texas and I'm driving in like right outside the city, I'm like, holy shit, these people have like huge farms and it's a totally different thing. But in LA, the mansion property is a huge, like unthinkably huge property. Yeah, for sure. The next question was, do you miss movie nights at the mansion? I definitely don't miss any time at the mansion. Like, I don't want to go back. But when I was re-watching these episodes for my YouTube, I would see scenes from the buffet and movie nights. And sometimes I would think, oh, that was a nice day. Like, if I had to go back and relive any moment, that would probably be one of it. I always enjoyed, like, the buffets and the movies. Like, those were some of my favorite times at the mansion. Yeah. And I hate it when I'm, like, out here telling my story and, like, want to have friends who basically only knew him from like a party buffet movie basis will be like she was never miserable she was always so happy like as if I'm gonna be like confiding in them but also like they're seeing me at some of the nicest times at the mansion like those were relatively like my best times there they're not like with me when I'm having private conversations with Hef or like in the bedroom or like with me on my day-to-day -day. yeah I do miss sometimes, like, I think, oh, it would be so nice, like, if there was, if I could go back to the mansion right now and, like, have dinner and a movie or whatever, or I, like, I definitely miss the parties, so I do miss some of that, and I miss, like, a lot of the people that would just get together regularly like that. I think that was such a fun thing to have all the time. Now, don't get me wrong, after living there for seven years, there's times where you're like, I don't feel like going down and being social with all these people tonight. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just want to, like, chill, like, in your room. But we didn't really have that choice. Yeah. So, um, there were times where I didn't want to. But there are times now where I look back on it and think, oh, that would have been fun. Like, it would be fun to, like, it's a Friday night and I feel like, oh, I don't have plans tonight. It would be fun to go to the mansion and do dinner and a movie if it still existed. Was there ever a rule that you were too tall to be a playmate or Hef's girlfriend? There definitely wasn't a rule. And I know that when Marilyn Grabowski was the editor at the magazine, they really liked getting tall playmates because Marilyn was more into like the fashion side of it. And she loved it when they got like a quote unquote real model. And I feel like Hef was the one who wanted more like the naive country girls who barely knew what they were doing. Um, and as far as I know, there was no rule to be too tall to be a girlfriend. There just weren't ever any really tall girlfriends. Hef's wife was tall, his last wife, and there was a Playboy pinball machine that was made in the 80s that had Hef standing next to his wife on the front of it, and the picture of Hef had been stretched. It had been, like, photoshopped to make him look taller, and I remember pointing that out to somebody, and they go, don't ever say that in front of him. Oh, my God! <laughs> Have you kept any of your Playboy merchandise, Bridget? Yeah, I kept a lot of my stuff. I mean, it's all in storage and I can't like access it easily, but I kept a ton of stuff. I kept stuff if it was like attached to some kind of fun memory or if it was something really rare or like, I don't know, more expensive or something like that. But for the most part, a lot of it I got rid of, like all the Playboy t-shirts and stuff like that because I'm like... I'm never going to wear that again. And there were plenty of years where I was like really disgusted with everything. I mean, I kind of wish I would have kept more of it just because I'm such an archivist. And like, I would love to have every single thing I wore on the show just because I like being organized like that and having all the stuff. But there were times when I was like, oh, let's clear up some space in storage. Let's get rid of all this stuff. Well, there was definitely some things like that, like T-shirts and, and clothes and stuff that I gave mm -hmm. away. But for the most part, and a lot of the jewelry, because we had so much knick-knacky jewelry, mm -hmm. like a lot of that I gave away. Because I'm not a big jewelry person to begin yeah. with. So, um, so, yeah. But, I mean, I feel like for the most part, like things that you might recognize, all of my costumes. Yeah. Um, I, I have a lot of stuff. Trust me, my parents and my storage bills can testify to how much stuff <laughs> I have. How did it work if a girlfriend had debt before she was a girlfriend and wasn't allowed to work? Did Hef pay it off? The way it worked for me is I had college debts, but I just saved what I could from my allowance. And I was really, really strict with my money and I paid it off as quickly as I could. I paid off any credit card debt. Um, I didn't ask Hef to like 
pay for it separately. There was one girl, one of the mean girls, who after she left, she wrote a thing and she was complaining about how Hef didn't even pay off her student loans. <laughs> well, when I came to the mansion, I didn't have any credit card debt, but I did still have some of my student loans and I'd been paying on them. Um, and even when I was at the mansion, I'd been paying on them for several years. And then, uh, I was talking to Mary about it one day, or was it Hef? It might've been straight to Hef. And he said, why didn't you tell me you had student loans? And he wrote me a check for them, but I didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> and I have been paying on them for years and, but I was kind of kicking myself thinking, shoot, I should have told them when I first moved in that I had student loans. <laughs> Were you guys allowed to have cell phones? We definitely were, and I think Hef preferred it that we have cell phones, so that way if we were out past curfew or he wanted to know where we were, one of his secretaries could call at any time. But also back then, like, they weren't smartphones, so, like, we weren't texting or anything like that. And I don't think I started texting until, like, right before I left the mansion. Like, I would say 2008. Not because texting didn't exist, but because not a lot of people were doing it. Like, nobody I knew was texting, but once I did start texting, like, it would annoy Hef so bad. Like, if we were at a party, and it wasn't like I was constantly on my phone the way people are today. Because, like I said, they weren't smartphones. There weren't that many people texting. It would just be, like, every once in a while. And he would get so mad if I dared look at my phone. Because he wanted me, like, at attention at all times, like you know, just paying attention to him, I guess. Like, I couldn't look away for one second without getting scolded, and that sucked. That was a lot of yeah. pressure. I remember you getting in a lot of trouble for texting. Yeah, it was so dumb. What was your go-to Starbucks coffee order when you lived at the mansion? Do you remember yours? Oh, I think mine's been the same, like, my whole life. Caramel macchiato? Yeah, and then <laughs> it changed to skinny when I found out yeah. you could do it skinny. Skinny, uh, caramel macchiato, um, grande. Mine was gross. I used to get a soy latte, and that grosses me out so bad because I would never drink soy milk now, and it's just, basically when you're getting a latte at Starbucks, you're getting like a glass of milk with a shot of coffee in it, so it grosses me out, but then I started, you know, as I always was, I was super, super like calorie conscious, so then I moved on to just getting like iced Americanos because there's no calories in that, and that's still what I do, and now I put like my sugar-free ready whip on it. <laughs> I remember asking you one time if I could try your soy latte thing just to taste it and all I tasted was a mouthful of vegetables I was like well that's oh gross. my god that's, that's so gross. funny <laughs> but also I didn't drink a ton of Starbucks back then I usually just got like a pot of coffee from the pantry yeah I got uh, plain coffee from the pantry but I always have to put creamer in it like french vanilla creamer so they would bring me a little carafe with like creamer and I put a lot of creamer um because I have to have like a sweetened coffee it doesn't have to be real sugar but it needs to be like sweet um but I remember we would get starbucks quite often like if we were out if we were out and out yeah and I would get one every morning when I was on my way to work too when I worked at the studio but also like starbucks was everywhere back then but I feel like it wasn't until like 2010 when people really got addicted to Starbucks to the point where I remember like when I was in Vegas thinking, huh, I wonder if Hef ever got a barista at the house because he would always do things to make the mansion be really appealing to the girls to have them hang out. Like, oh, you can use the gym whenever you want, the tanning beds, all the things like the, you can order whatever you want to eat. And when we were there, I remember you asked why they didn't do espresso drinks. And they said, oh, we couldn't do it because, the, you know, the drink orders are so complicated. We basically have to have like a full time barista. But also back then, there just wasn't that much of a demand for it. People just drank plain coffee with, like, sugar and cream or whatever. But then about, around about 2010, I remember thinking, I wonder if Hef ever got a barista, because I feel like it would be hard to keep girls there. They won't be going on their Starbucks runs. <laughs> I really do. That's so funny. And then I heard somebody, this guy I follow on Twitter, was talking about how, like, there, the Starbucks in Westwood closed. And he goes, oh, that's where all the Playboy bunnies would go. And I'm like, did they go there after we left? Was that, like, the hang? The UCLA Starbucks? I don't know. It's a mystery. We'll never know. That's not the one I would usually go to, though. You went to Beverly Hills one, right? Where the Barachi is now? Yes. We'll get, we'll get to that. Yes. What was the most asked question around the beginning of the show? I remember the one that annoyed me so bad. It's fingernails on a blackboard when I think of it now. 
So people would always ask us about our sex lives. Yeah, I was going to say, do you all sleep with hats? That's yeah. That's number one question always was. And the way they would ask it, and for some reason it was worded this way quite often. It wasn't just one person. Like, I remember Billy Bush saying it, but it was a lot of people. They'd be like, so, on the topic of sex, how does that work? Or they'd ask, like, are you all dating? Happen? They'd be like, how does that work? And we never wanted to answer. It's like, what the fuck? Do you want, like, a breakdown of the rotation? They did. Right. But, like, we don't want to talk about it. It's gross. And I just, like, I think I've said this before, but do you ask other people that when you're doing interviews? We were the only ones. Did Hef ever take you on individual dates, or did everyone always go at once? (laughs) I never went on any individual dates with Hef, and the only other times we went anywhere by ourselves were just times where he wasn't allowed to bring more than one person. Like, one time we went to New York, and there was a day that he got to go on the floor and ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange, so he only brought me because he could only bring one person. It was just, like, me, him, and his daughter. And then, um, oh, I think people were outraged by that. Well, there was one person who complained about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, um, the only other time was every year he would go to USC because he sponsored a censorship class at the USC film school. And every year he would go there once a year to like do a Q and a with the class and then have lunch with the Dean after. And he would take me to that just cause it was, I don't know if he was only allowed to bring one person or if I was the only person who ever expressed interest and then it just kind of became a tradition that would just me and him went, but yeah, I think he used to not go with anybody and I said, and I said it sounded cool and he's like, oh, you want to go? But those were like the only times. Do you remember any times? Oh, I never had a one-on-one date or uh, event with him. The, the closest I got to that was something that if we just, you and I went. Yeah. I mean, we went to Mary's house with Hef, just you and I, mm-hmm. and for a barbecue thing in her backyard, and it was for somebody's anniversary, one of Hef's friends' anniversary yeah. parties and stuff, and we were doing those tiles. Yeah, those tiles. I remember that. And um, so there was, like, very intimate, small group settings, but never, like, solo. Yeah, and it was always, like, like going to Mary's house, like, we wanted to do that, but other girls were like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> Did guests sign NDAs to visit the mansion? No, they didn't. Half always wanted to be like the ultimate host. He wanted people to have the best time ever and everything. He didn't have people sign NDAs. Um, And people are always surprised that we were not made to sign NDAs also. And that might seem surprising, but to me it's not surprising because Hef didn't want anything to stand in the way of him getting laid. And I think if he was going to have somebody stop and sign a paper before they went up into the bedroom, it might make a woman pause and be like, wait, what am I doing? And he didn't want anything like that. He'd rather have people going, talking all kinds of shit than having somebody think, maybe I don't want to go up into the bedroom. (laughs) Yeah. No, yeah, we never signed NDAs, but I think all the staff had to. Yeah, employees did. And then, um, so not in our time, but later... Everyone was made to sign NDAs. But yeah, but I don't think that was Hef's idea. I don't think it was Hef's idea either. Kendra was always seen drinking underage. Did production not care about that? Yeah, I don't think production cared. I don't think production cared. And I personally don't care. Like, I'm not here finger wagging. Like, oh, she shouldn't have been drinking because I feel like everybody drinks in high school or college sometimes. But yeah, it was weird. It was just kind of like exceptions were always made for her. The one time people got in trouble for it was we were filming at the Palms and then the Nevada gaming board fined the Palms a huge fine because they found out that Kendra was under 21 and she was at the clubs drinking and she was at the gambling tables and everything. So they had to pay big for having her there. A lot. I heard a figure and it was a lot. Yeah. Um, you know what though? I do think that they asked her to try and keep it low key, but she just didn't. Oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. Next question was, Hef treated you three like you were all very dumb openly. Were you aware about that before the show aired? I definitely was. And it bothered me so bad. Like we would be sitting in the movie room watching a movie, an old movie. And he'd lean over to me and whisper something like, 
this story takes place during World War II. And I remember times when I would look at you on the other side of me and I'd give you a look because I was, I just wanted to scratch my eyes out because it's like, I'm not fucking stupid. I have a basic understanding of history. Like he was trying to tell me stuff that people learn in grade school. And I think it's one of the things when people wonder like, oh, why do these old men want to date younger women? I mean, other than some other obvious reasons, it's because they want that cow-eyed 19, 20 year old who has no life experience looking up at them like, ooh, big successful man. Everything you do is good. Like they want that. They want to feel this ego boost because these young women are so fascinated by all that they know, which I was to a lot of an extent, but I'm not that fucking dumb. You don't need to tell me this takes place during World War. It's like no fucking shit, dude. And it would be so frustrating. I feel like it's been so common throughout my life, not just with Hef, that I just, I just expect it. Yeah, that's I expect people to not to think I don't know anything, and uh, I I expect people to think that I'm not smart enough to understand something or get basic things. Yeah, it's weird. And there were times I felt like have thought of me as smart, but he thought of me as smart for a girl, which mm-hmm. is very very different. Like there were times he would ask me to like read scripts for him that he didn't want to read because he wanted like my opinion, and if you totally thought somebody was a complete imbecile you wouldn't have them do that but yeah there were a lot of times when I was like oh my god did Hef consider some of the girls as his girlfriends that were always with you all no whoever was a girlfriend was like a very official thing at the time and it could probably seem confusing to outsiders because the revolving door was so consistent or even with consistent girls who were girlfriends Uh that would be confusing But it was always very official who was a girlfriend at the time versus who wasn't. Yeah. Was Hef fake on camera? He came across as very charming. I mean, he was very charming in real life. That's why any of us were there in the first place. Yeah, I don't think it was fake. I think what you saw was real. Yeah, what you saw was real. In fact, sometimes I'm surprised that he wasn't more aware of the cameras. Like there are times when he just says really insensitive things about women's bodies or weight or is really condescending and I'm like dude like you have no self-awareness right now like you think that's just okay to be on camera yeah so that's kind of surprising I do think on the other side of that coin he was always conscientious of trying to make himself look like this really benevolent like do-gooder who's like so generous to these poor unfortunate women that he just swept up off the street when it's like no we gotta we gotta kind of pay a price to be here but But I think in a lot of ways, what you saw was what you got. Mm -hmm. Were all the girls on birth control? How did y'all prevent pregnancy? (laughs) I don't think any of us ever thought for a second we would get pregnant at the mansion. I actually was, though, on birth control pills. And I stopped um, them when I went to do the egg retrieval. Mm -hmm. And then didn't go back on them because for a bunch of different reasons that we can get into later. But, um, But yeah, I was on them for a while. But it was more like controlling periods and just keeping up with like with the way it had been yeah so I'm trying to go off of them I mean I really don't know if anybody else was on birth control or not I just know that for me I felt like I there was zero danger of getting pregnant I wasn't worried about getting pregnant yeah I don't I don't think anybody was and that wasn't why I was on them yeah and also like if you look at Hef's history and the fact that he's only ever had kids when he was like married and it was planned like Whatever he's doing, he knows what he's doing. So I just don't think anybody ever thought, like, he's never had, like, a person, I mean, he's had people come forward and say, I'm your kid, but it was always, like, you know, determined not to be true. Like, he's never had, like, an accident over all those years. So yeah, just nobody was ever worried about it. Yeah, and um, also, I just had this revelation as we're talking about this, but I also never went off of the pill while I was at the mansion because I always felt like, why would I go off it? I always felt like it was a, that the mansion was so temporary that if yeah. I went off the pill, next thing I know I might be like out and single and on my own. I need to stay on this because there's, there's a, you know, time frame yeah. that you have to be on. So like, why am I going to stop this? Yeah. What is your favorite centerfold layout of all time? I think I know what one you're going to say. <laughs> oh, Jody's. I thought you were going to say Stacey Fuson. Really? 
I swear I thought that was your favorite. Hers is one of my favorites too. So Stacy Fuson was Miss February 1999 and her pictorial was so cute. It was like wintry. She's like in a hot tub in the snow and she was just so pretty. And those pictures like still hold up today. Like they don't look dated. They still look gorgeous. Yeah, I, still, I do love hers. And uh -huh. I think it may have been mine for a while, but I really love like um, Jody's. I, there's this one particular, Jodi Ann Patterson for the, uh, she got Playmate of the Year, and I can't remember if it was her Playmate or her um, Playmate of the Year pictorial, but there's this one where she's like arched, and it's like shows from like kind of above, and it uh -huh. has her booty in the air, like it's so pretty, and I love the, on her Playmate of the Year cover, I love that pink with like the Playboy pop, like lollipop. Yeah, and, it's like, really Like I just cute. think the whole thing is so beautiful. Um, yeah, there's so many that I love. I mean, Jodi Ann Patterson's, Angela Little's, Karen McDougal's, Stacey Fuson, some of the ones that you mentioned. Like, there's so many. I think I just wanted to be a playmate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a good question because it kind of applies to the last episode we talked about. Somebody asked, did the mansion fireworks scare the dogs? Mm. I don't remember it being a problem for any of my dogs, but I know it was a big deal for Archie, the house dog, and they had to keep him down in the basement during the fireworks I remember one time going down to the basement and there was like a piece of wood like on a wall or like on, on a corner of one of the lockers or something and it was like chewed like Archie had chewed the wood so wow. I hope he didn't get any splinters from that but also it reminded me of how Hef had this koi pond in the backyard and there were always ducks on the koi pond. And when the fireworks would start, you would see ducks just scramble out of yeah. the koi pond. As far as I know, no ducks were ever harmed in the making of the 4th of July party. But they would see the sparks coming down and they would just scatter. They would take off. It was always guaranteed that the birds were going to fly away. How was Winnie during the fireworks? I feel like she was okay. Um, I would take her upstairs. If I had her down for 4th of July, which I did sometimes, I would take her upstairs and put her in my room and make sure the windows were shut and stuff like that. But I think she was always okay. She never, even like later in life, she didn't seem really bothered by them. Yeah. What if girls were on their period when they had a shoot scheduled? Would they cancel? Oh, I this has happened to me. Really? Just because you're feeling sick? No, 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 I didn't cancel, but I'd been on my period when we were shooting. Oh, yeah, so people didn't really cancel that much. Like, when I worked at the studio, I never had anybody say, oh, my God, I started my period, I have to cancel. Because the photos weren't, like, up close and personal with your vag, generally. <laughs> so, like, you could just tuck a tampon string and no one would know. <laughs> well, I asked, like, what I should do, and they told me to cut the string off. Yeah. And I was like, oh, but then, like, you, you risk have to, losing the tampon. Yeah, though. then you have to go digging for it. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I was like, uh, I don't, I'm not really comfortable doing that. Yeah. But I feel like usually it was so rare that the photo would be explicit enough. You could just, like, pull it up your thong and, like, nobody would know. Yeah. Phoebe asks, in episode four, you get to Vegas so early, you're eating breakfast in the room, but how is that possible? Did you book the room for the night before? Well, production would have booked the room for us, and the Palms also had a partnership with Playboy, so they wanted to be real accommodating, so production would have just hit the Palms up ahead of time, and they would have had the room ready for us. Yeah, like it didn't matter what time we got there, the room would have been waiting for us. What was your favorite trip during the Girls Next Door era? Oh, that is so hard. <laughs> that is, like, impossible to pick because there were so many good ones for different reasons, too. Yeah, I think if I had to pick a favorite place I went, I would pick, like, our first trip to Europe because we got to go so many cool places. It was my first trip to Europe. Like, all the amazing places we got to go that weren't even covered on the show were just, like, lifetime dream places I wanted to go. But as far as, like, good vibes and fun... The episode trip that stands out in my head the most is Anastasia's birthday at the Madonna Inn. So fun. That was just so fun. It was just us girls. Like, Hef wasn't there, so I wasn't worried about getting yelled at if I was having too much fun. And the Madonna Inn has been, like, a part of my life regularly since that trip. Like, I just loved that trip. It was so fun. And you know what's funny, too, is I saw somebody post somewhere saying that it looked like we weren't having fun on that trip for Anastasia's birthday, and that the next party, whatever it was, that we really let loose, and it looks like we're all having fun, and I'm thinking, really? Because we had so much fun at the Madonna Inn. Yeah, I don't remember not having fun at all. And of course, there were, like, special trips, like, going back to Alaska was really special for me, and, like, my sister's wedding in Jamaica. Those are probably my top four. See, there's so many that I can't even pick, and maybe it's the Libra in me, like I say all the time, but I can't pick, like, favorites. There were, there were so many good ones, and for so many different reasons. Yeah. 
You can't even narrow it down, top four? <laughs> no, because of, because the second I think of one, I'm like, oh, but this was really cool, too. Yeah. Because, like, I totally forgot about Jamaica until you just said yeah. that. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my God, that's right. We went to Jamaica. How incredible <laughs> was that? Um, so, no, it's hard. Paris, definitely, though, for sure, because we got to do the catacombs yeah. and Versailles. And uh, I know it's not in Paris. What about Pompeii? I know. Pompeii was like a dream, <laughs> a dream of mine for so long. We got to see Pompeii. So, like, there's so many things. Fountain Court. And, oh, my God. See? <laughs> and the Tower of London. <clears throat> yeah. The Tower of London was incredible. Amy asks, did you guys have a signature scent that you wore at the mansion? Yeah, we had our own perfume lines. We did. We made our own perfumes for a minute. As far as, like, commercial scents I would wear, I would either wear Angel or Amarige. I remember I had, I had a Happy stage, Clinique Happy. Yeah. Um, a Dior. I can't remember what it was called, though. God, what else? I feel like there were ones that I went through phases on, and then I just all of a sudden will get sick of a perfume. But, like, I don't want to wear that anymore. Yeah. I wear more, like, essential oils now. Like, I have a few perfumes I wear, but I definitely don't wear, like, what I wore at the mansion. And I've never, like, gone back and tried to smell it. I feel like I would be jettisoned back to, like, a bad time. <laughs> Smells are like that. They will take you back. The second I smell something, it'll take me exactly to that spot. It's crazy. It's yeah. It's the most powerful memory for me. Yeah. I don't want to smell my perfume. I don't want to smell Hef's Cologne. Nothing. I don't even know. Do you know what Hef's Cologne was? Karl Lagerfeld. It is just plain, like are yeah. I think plain? it's just plain called Karl Lagerfeld. It's like a tall, skinny bottle, and the perfume's like orange color, and it has like a circle on top. I kind of want to smell it just because. <laughs> Fasten your seat belts. Ah, uh, it's Shannon asks, were you guys all under contract to be on Kendra's show, meaning Kendra's spinoff that she had after oh. the mansion? We were not under contract in any way, and it's an interesting question because. When we left the mansion, at least from my perspective, we were all so genuinely supportive of each other and happy for each other. And when I was asked to go on your show and when I was asked to go on Kendra's show, I did it no hesitation. Like, I'm sure I was paid a token amount, but I never asked what that was or cared or would have ever thought to negotiate because we were just all so supportive, or at least I thought we were, of each other at that time and just happy for each other and happy for what each other had going on. I was blissfully unaware that Kendra had talked trash about us in her book. Like, nobody told me about it. I didn't know until years later. So, yeah, that was the stupidity I was operating under. <laughs> yeah, I was happy to do everyone's spinoff, too. There was no contract or obligation to do it, but we were just happy to support each other. Um, I do know that... Uh, there was pushback, I was told, of Kendra doing my Beaches show. She, they wanted her to show me around San Diego, and she didn't want to do it. Do you know why? I don't know why. I just felt like she didn't want to support it. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know. It's hard to say with stuff like that because I feel like Kevin really stirred the pot. Like, he was no better than Hef in that he liked to pit us against each other. And... That happened a lot with me and Kendra later. <laughs> but yeah. Hallie's Comet 18 asks, dying to know about the Barachi lawsuit. So Barachi was this shop in Beverly Hills that we would buy dresses and lingerie outfits from for the parties and stuff. And I had always wanted to buy stuff from there because it was really expensive. Like I could have never afforded it before I lived at the mansion. And the first mansion party I ever went to, Hef was dating the Bentley twins and they were wearing Barachi and they looked so gorgeous. So it might sound weird that I was so fixated on wearing outfits from one place, but you kind of had to be there. That was kind of like the vision in my head of like what one of Hef's girlfriends should look like. And when I moved in and we had our first event to go to, I said to one of the girlfriends, oh, I want to shop at the store that the twins shopped at. What is that? And she said, oh, you can't shop there anymore because Hef's in a lawsuit with them. But I asked him if I could go there. And he said, yeah, as long as you go and pay cash, that's fine with me. And Barachi was always great working with me and like doing what I wanted within the budget. So worked out for me. Yeah, I shopped there too. And I have several dresses from them and they're amazing. Oh, I still have all my Barachi dresses. I did a YouTube video on it. I have a whole rack of them out. And I'm like, you guys might not understand this now. But back then, I was really fixated on this brand. <laughs> I have a bunch, too. There's one that I donated to charity, sold for. Um, oh, which one? The white one that I wore to the Grammys. Oh, yeah, that one's pretty. 
um, I gave, I didn't sell it to charity. I gave it to charity mm-hmm. to be auctioned off for, um, and then the, the money went to, do you remember the guy that got shot in the head that was in my brother's platoon? Yeah. It went to his, um, medical or whatever. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Didn't they make you one for beaches that had like shells on it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> they cute. made me one for beaches. We put the shells on it. It's so hat. cute. Yeah. That's for my premiere of beaches. And when we were talking about Starbucks earlier and what Starbucks we used to go to, there used to be a Starbucks right where Wilshire meets Santa Monica in Beverly Hills. I think it's still there, but it's just not taking up as much of the building as it used to. Maybe. And Barachi's in that building now. Yeah. But then it closed and they're moving. Again? Yeah. Ashley told me. Oh, because Barachi (laughs) used to be at like one Wilshire, like right... Like right on Rodeo Drive. I mean one Rodeo, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, right on Wilshire, but one Rodeo. And um, then they moved over to that Starbucks location. Now they're moving again. Now they're moving again. Yeah, interesting. Sarah Ann asks, Holly, I'm hoping you can walk us through everything once you moved into the main bedroom. Do you get to add any decor of your own to the room? No. Maybe on the main bed, maybe on your side of the bed. No. I did add a (laughs) desk to the vanity because I really needed like some desk space, especially since I was working at the studio. So I had... I don't know if the mansion had a resident wood carver. That sounds awfully quaint and provincial, but they had somebody who could do carvings because Hef's bedroom was all carved wood. Like there were all like these statues and mermaids and grapes and stuff like carved into the walls. So I had a desk made to put into the vanity and I wanted it carved to match everything that was already in the room. And they did a really cute job. Like they did the drawer, like the pan- front panel of like the drawer on the desk. I had them carve like my favorite birds from the zoo and they put my initials and they put like hearts. It was so freaking cute. So I got to do that and that was really cool, but I wasn't like allowed to like decorate it. I mean, I didn't have the carpet taken out of the vanity too, just because I had dogs and I wanted like easier cleanup in case yeah. anybody had ac- accidents, but I didn't like do any of like my own decor. I always kept it really like what was consistent with the bedroom. Did you have any say in the thermostat AC room temperature? I don't remember that being an issue. I'm sure Hef probably had, you know, when the housekeepers came in every day, they probably made sure it was set to a certain temperature. I don't remember ever adjusting it or ever being an issue. You know what's funny about that? I don't remember ever adjusting my thermostat in the room. It must have just kind of been a thing that the housekeepers always set it to like a really neutral. Must have been. Yeah, I don't know. When you were, when you were Hef with... When you or Hef were sick, would you sleep in another room to avoid getting the other sick? No. That's why I have an immune system of steel these days. <laughs> Lastly, was it uncomfortable having your bed be open to others at any random time? It really wasn't. Like, people... I mean, I guess somebody could wander in there in the middle of the day and look for Hef, but people really didn't. Like, people would try to find him to, like, get their allowance and stuff. But I don't think people really, like, wanted to come into the bedroom. So it really wasn't open. There was a period of time not too long after I moved in and became the main girlfriend when it was just me and one other girl living at the mansion. Everybody moved out and all these women were like clamoring to move in. I think it was like right before you started coming out. And all of a sudden, because everybody wanted to move in so bad and everybody was competing and wanted to like show how down they were, people started coming to Hep's room every night being like, we want to watch Sex in the City. And I hated my life because Mm -hmm. I had nowhere to go, no room of my own, no choice. Everybody would come in. Everybody would bring their animals for some reason. People would bring their dogs and cats and monkeys and sit on the bed. And this was the bed I had to sleep in later. Like how unsanitary and gross. So everybody was like, we want to watch Sex in the City. And they really didn't. Like they'd be sitting there at the end of the bed flipping through magazines. That really made me uncomfortable to the point where I said something to have like, can I go back to room five? Like I'm feeling really smothered and he threw an absolute fit at me and immediately turned it around narcissist style. Like now I feel like I'm being smothered because I was asking for a little bit of space. It was just a nightmare, but eventually it did stop. Yeah. Not too long after it started, but that people always ask, Oh, if it was so bad, why didn't you leave? That was one of the times I was really close to leaving, but he kind of like fixed it at the last minute. So I was like, Oh, okay. Maybe he does care. And nothing ever really changed, but it was just one of those moments. And then they asked, were you expected to leave when others came to talk to half? I never was made to feel that way. I don't know. 
I always appreciated if you stuck around. Yeah. Almost like I always felt uncomfortable and awkward because I was usually asking for something like allowance or if I could go home or go do something or whatever. And so I was always like, if Holly's here, she's got my back. <laughs> yeah. Or like, somebody else is witnessing this. Like, Cat <laughs> smiles a lot. Asks out of all the playmates we meet on the show, who was the sweetest, kindest, had a heart of gold. That's hard to answer. Impossible. Yeah, it's hard to answer, but it's not because there's so many. Like initially, I want to say, well, Tiffany Fallon. Everybody loved yeah, her. She was the so first nice. One that comes to my yeah, but, but then I don't want to answer it. Yeah, I don't want to answer it because there were so many amazing people that we loved, like Kara, Sarah Underwood, like Kimberly Holland, like all these people come to mind. Nicole and I, Whitehead. <laughs> and I feel bad even mentioning anybody because then I feel like all the people I'm leaving out. Yeah. And that's one thing that I think is important to point out is there were so many amazing women and amazing friendships, and I think a lot of people. People, you know, get really hung up on the negativity and they notice just the negativity. Yeah, I think, uh, I would say 95% of the people were nice, but there were a couple. Yeah, but... there's a couple of bad seeds and, you know, we give a lot of talk to like the mean girls and, you know, I give a lot of talk about Hef, but there were a lot of really awesome people too. Mm -hmm. So many friendships that were made. Yeah. Taylor asks, can we talk about the bunny suits that the official Playboy website sells? Holly put it perfectly into words when she called it the cheapo version. <laughs> I've always wanted to wear or at least try on one of the original suits, so I was curious if either of you guys knew why they don't just produce the original patented suit design from the 1960s. They can't because each one was custom fitted to a, one woman's body. That's what made them so good. Yeah, it's, you can't sell it online because it just they're not ready to wear. They're, by definition, a couture piece. Even the old ones they had, you know, when we were at Playboy that the Playmates would wear, they would, anytime a new Playmate was assigned to a bunny costume, they would have to, like, take the whole thing apart and, like, re-sew it, basically, to fit that woman's body because they're so like fitted to every inch of your body that like if if I were to try on yours it wouldn't fit like there'd be something wrong with it like it either wouldn't zip up or like you know vice versa if we switch like maybe the crotch would be too long that's or, what I was just gonna say yeah. like you have to think it's the length and the width and the boob cups like yeah. all of those things have to be made for the person's body yeah so that's why they don't sell it but but I think this is a good place to wrap up. Thank you guys for all your questions. Those are so amazing. Yeah. And we're excited for our episode next week because we've got a bunch of really fun episodes coming up. And don't forget, if you are in our Patreon, to go ahead and start posting your questions on the Q&A section in Discord for the next Q&A section. Yeah. And if you guys want to be a part of our first live podcast experience, you can get tickets at moment.co slash girls next level. And we will be talking about all the playboy urban legends, rumors, and blind items, everything you've always wanted to know. Yeah. Just so you guys know, that is a digital event. A lot of people have asked me, where is this located? <laughs> it's digital. It's, uh, it's in your bedroom. It's live. So we'll see you guys there. Bye. Bye guys.